Hello, welcome to Free Bible Commentary with Pastor Teacher Dr. Bob Utley. Be sure to visit Free Bible Commentary at www.freebiblecommentary.org. Now, here's Bob. In Genesis 1, 24 through 2, 3, finishing the uh, chapter 1 creation account. And of course, I don't believe there's two creation accounts. It's very common in Hebrew literature for a very uh, generalized uh, subject to be dealt with parallel in more detail. So I think one and two are parallel accounts, not divergent accounts or uh, P and J. I really have problems with, with source criticism of the Old Testament. There are some very interesting things here. Uh, we've dealt with creation out of nothing. We call it ex nihilo from Latin. It really comes, I think it's used in Second Maccabees uh, for the first time it's used, the word. But basically God spoke and things came. Augustine recognized that there was a distinction in Genesis 1 between God creating directly out of nothing and that which God created bringing forth. Now, let's look at that in verse 24. And God said, and of course, we're in the, this is Elohim. It's, it's plural. I'm going to deal with the plurality of God when I come to let us make man. So let me hold off here, okay? Uh, then let the earth bring forth. Notice the earth is to bring forth. God did not uh, create by speaking. He created by having what he already made bring forth. Now, Augustine said there are two acts of creation. One where God creates out of nothing, and he created matter and the spirits, both of man and angels. And then he says there's the organization of what God created. Now, the reason that Genesis 1 is so important to us is that Greek philosophy has posited or postulated that matter and God or spirit are co-eternal that God did the best he could with obstinate matter. But the creation account from the Hebrews is so different. There is spirit, God, the creator, redeemer, who's personally involved in his world to create it and then only to create it. But providence means he's actively involved on an ongoing basis with it. And that's basically the Hebrew view. Now, then it says, uh, bring forth living creatures. Now, this word living creatures is the same word as going to be used for living soul. It's the word nephesh. You can see it again in chapter 2, verse 7, where it's used of man. So basically, man and the land animals share this uh, mystical thing called nephesh that in the New Testament we'd call pneuma, or spirit, or soul. I hate to use the word soul because Greek philosophy is so fouled up the waters here. We don't have a soul. We are a soul. But the soul is not what's different between man and the animals. It's the breath of God, as we'll see in chapter 2. Now, the, the animals mentioned here are land animals, uh, domestic and wild, large and small. And so here we have man and the animals sharing the sixth day of creation. Uh, after their kind, cattle and creeping things. Now, the word cattle is the word behemoth. It's used the sea monster, I mean the land monster later on, but here it just means domesticated cattle. Now, creeping things means maybe crawly things. It's the same word used in verse 21 for that which moves, maybe creeps or crawls like lizards and things like that, okay? And the beast of the earth after their kind, and it was so. And God made the beast of the earth after their kind, the cattle after their kind, and everything that creeps on the ground after its kind, and the Lord saw that it was good. Now, verse 25 is basically a restatement or a summary of verse 24, yet in the reverse order. There's been much discussion why. I think it's just a literary device and not a whole lot of theological content there. Then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Oh, has there been a hair pull there? Now, let us is what I want to talk about briefly. The text does not say. We can't get it from an exegetical understanding of this passage. So we go to history and see what the godly commentators have done through the years. Three major theories have come out of this verse. Number one, basically rabbinical, says that it's the plural of majesty. Now, the only problem with that is that this plural of majesty does not occur in the Hebrew Scriptures and does not develop in literature and other cultures until much later. So I don't think that's really it. You can see why the rabbis are nervous about a plurality in God. Number two has been that it is the heavenly council, and by that, the angels that surround Yahweh. 
And some go back to 1 Kings 22:19, where God addresses these heavenly hosts. Some see Job chapter 1, where the sons of God come before God and Satan comes with them. Well, I do believe there are other spiritual beings besides God. I think he created the angels before he created man. Seraphim, cherubim, uh, the angels that look like men, Michael, Gabriel, others, uh, Satan. But I really don't think that angels have anything to do with creation. The rabbis say men are so close to God, the angels were jealous, and so God tried to alleviate their fears by asking them permission. What a bunch of baloney. I just don't think it refers to the angels. I don't think anywhere in the world we can get that. Now, the third one, by the way, that was the basic theory of Rashi, a middle-aged uh, Jewish commentator, and many others. I basically think it's a plurality within God. Now, at this point, I can't assert it's a trinity because I don't want to read full-blown New Testament or stand there, although I certainly have it in the background. You say, Bob, why do you believe there's a plurality in God? There's several reasons. I've done a tape on the trinity where I've gone to 45 minutes of detail, you might want to send for that. But let me just summarize if I could quickly. Uh, basically, the, the word Elohim, now El is the general name for God, but it's plural, Elohim. We're not sure of its etymology. It's not polytheism. Uh, apparently, it's used for God quite often. The rabbis say it means God in his power and creativeness and Yahweh in his mercy and grace. That may be true. Uh, I certainly don't believe in two different sources, J, uh, a Yahwistic source, and P, a priestly source. But it is plural, and when it says, let us make man in our image, I want you to notice down the next verse it says, God created man in his own image. So there's the singular, his own image, but the plural occurs earlier. So it seems that we have a plurality in God. In the high holy prayer of Jewish monotheism called the Shema, Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 6, the Hebrew word for hear, O Israel, the Lord thy God is one Lord is the plural form of the word one. Genesis 2.24, the two shall become one, there's that same plural form. So I believe there's instances throughout the Old Testament of a plurality of God. And you might want to see Isaiah chapter 6, verse 8 for another example of that. When we come to the New Testament, it is obvious that if Jesus Christ is divine and the Holy Spirit is a personality, whether we like it or not, we have a triune unity. <laughs> Difficult to talk about. Difficult to describe. But apparently a biblical truth. Let us make. Now, the word here is man. It's the word Adam. Everywhere the word Adam appears in the Bible, except the first few chapters of Genesis, it's a generic term for mankind. It apparently comes from the term Adama that means ground. Now, some go back to the idea of the redness that may be a... a, a some of the uh, derivation is redness, and some go back to dirt. Man was made out of red dirt, maybe the inference here. Uh, and so we have Adam. The, the Septuagint makes it anthropos, which makes it generic. Talk about men and women. In our image and according to our likeness. Uh, in your notes, I did kind of a historical survey. I don't, I don't want to forget any, so I'll just help me read part of it to you. The early church has struggled with what does it mean in image and likeness, and most of the early church divided the two. In my opinion, they are synonymous, and that follows John Calvin and Martin Luther. But uh, the word image basically means to hew out, like a, to hew out a shape of an idol. It's usually used for idol worship. Um, the word likeness is used in Ezekiel chapter 1 for he couldn't really describe what God was like in his throne chariot. So say it's like this, it's like this. Um, it, many have made a distinction. I want to show that to you in history. The earliest distinction we find is in Irenaeus and Tertullian. They made the image the physical aspects of man and the likeness the spiritual aspects of man. The next major theological uh, understanding comes from Clement of Alexandria and Origen, who said the image is the non-physical characteristics of man and the likeness are aspects of man that can be developed like uh, morality or holiness. But if they're not developed, they will be lost. Athanasius, Hilary, Ambrose, Augustine, John of Damascus basically followed uh, this understanding of Clement of Alexandrian origin. The scholastics or the medieval scholars of which Thomas Aquinas would be a good example. And this is basically the Roman Catholic view, uh, at least the uh, majority view. The image is man's national, uh, rational ability and his freedom. 
Now, his freedom, that those are natural gifts that man was created with. The likeness is original righteousness and the super added gifts, the supernatural gifts of, um, that were destroyed or marred in the fall. That's why Roman Catholicism, following Thomas Aquinas, believes you can think your way to God. Thomas Aquinas is very rationalism, rationalistic, and I think our age is going that way. Our age will be looked on as an age of rationalism. Now, the Reformers basically all denied that these two words are different. Uh, even though Calvin and Luther saw them a little differently in details, basically said they were, they were the same. In our image and according to our likeness. There's a couple of places in the New Testament this same concept of image and likeness is used. Uh, basically, we see that from after the fall that's used, image and likeness is used in chapter 5, verse 1 and 3, chapter 9, verse 6. So the, although man fell and the image may have been marred, the image is still there. Look in the New Testament, if you will, in 1 Corinthians 11, 7, uh, Ephesians 4, 24, Colossians 3, 10, and James 3, 9 for image and likeness. And let them rule over them. Now, the word let them rule over, if you'll see down in verse 28, the very same word rule is used again, but is added to it the word subdue. Now, rule and subdue, subdue is in a command mode in verse 28. Both etymologies mean to tread or to trample or to overcome. Some say it's used as an invading army trampling on one's land. And that's very true. They're very strong and aggressive terms. Unfortunately, man has interpreted these as, uh, as humanity can do what it wants to with God's physical creation. But I think we're reaping the whirlwind from that. I think much of our diseases are coming from our pollution that we've done in greed. Um, and so I think this does not mean that. Although it, there's some, um, it's hard to know exactly what these early accounts mean because the word image used for idols is used uh, of man being created. And here the word trample and tread is used for man dominion. It is obvious when I look at this theologically that man is very much connected to the animals. Both the land animals and man are made on the same day. They both are said to have nephish. They both are made from the ground. They both eat green plants. They both are told to be fruitful and multiply through sexual generation. So man has much in common with the animals. But man also has something in common with God. He's made in the image and likeness of God. He is given dominion over all creation. God forms him individually and breathes into him the breath of life. And so that there is a likeness between man and his world. And there is a unique difference between man and his world. And this emphasizes both of those aspects. So we have a biological orientation and we have a spiritual orientation. This is probably where people begin to think of man as a, a trinity like God is, body, soul, and spirit. A watchman Nee develops that. Many others have pushed that in our day. I really don't think we are. I think we're a unity with different aspects, but I don't think you can divide man up. Because God's will seems to be that man is going to have a physical aspect throughout eternity. And God's concerned with all of us, not just some of us. Okay. Notice in verse 27 where it says, And God created them in his own image. In, his, in the image of God created he them. Male and female created he them. Now it's very interesting in verse 27 that the word bara is used three times. Now there are three words used in Genesis for God creating. But bara is the most significant. It's used in the preponderance of the times in Genesis 1. Uh, basically, it is only used for God, and it means to come out of nothing almost. Now, not, not the ph philosophical deal of ex nihilo, but out of nothing God brought these things. The repeated use three times really emphasizes that this is an act of God. Now, now he may have used his physical creation to generate other physical creations that may be in here. But the real truth of Genesis 1 is God did it. I think I told you last uh, lesson in 1 through 23. The real truth of Genesis 1 is not how, but who. Moving rapidly toward the covenant people. Now, notice if you would, where it mentions male and female created, him, created he them. Uh, this shows me that both maleness and femaleness are in the image of God. It's not males in the image of God and then females in other images. They are both fully in the image of God. Verse 28, and God blessed them. Now, the bless seems to be related to be fruitful and multiply. 
Um, he has said that very same thing back of the animals in verse 22. Now, you say, well, how does this relate to overpopulation? It doesn't relate at all. This is an ancient book. is dealing with a, uh, the first couple and filling the earth. A few animals and filling the earth. And so it, it doesn't speak to that. And we try to read our own uh, culture's questions into an ancient book. We do terrible damage to it. Now, it says, fill the earth, subdue it and rule it. Uh, here is man over the animals, over creation. Then God said, Behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is on the surface of the earth, and every tree which had its fruit yielding seed it is food for you. Now, if you'll turn back a little earlier in Genesis, back in the, the creation of the plant kingdom, you'll see there are three basic kinds of plants. There are the grasses of the field, there are the uh, grains, and there are uh, the fruits. Now, the grasses are going to be given to the animals to eat in verse 30. The grains and the fruits are going to be given to man to eat. And there seems to be a real distinction here. Now, we can see these grains and fruit as food in Genesis 2.16 and Genesis 6.21. Now, in Genesis 9.3, man is allowed to eat some of the animals. Apparently, even now, long before the Mosaic Covenant, there is a distinction between clean and unclean. Uh, remember Noah taking seven pairs of the clean and only one of the unclean? Some say, well, it's to make sacrifice. Well, that's true. But there's also a thing. There was no crop that year. They couldn't plant that year. Much of the uh, plant kingdom was destroyed in the flood. So it seems to me that God gave them meat to eat that, that first year as kind of a stopgap measure. You say, well, Bob, do you think that man should be a vegetarian according to the will of God? I don't think there's enough information here to do that. I think veg uh, vegetables are very healthy, but I don't think red meat's a sin. We just read too much in here and become so dogmatic, it's unbelievable. I don't think we can say that. Verse 30. To every beast of the earth and to every bird of the sky and to everything that moves on the earth which has life, I have given every green plant for food. Now, what does that mean? Well, basically, I think it means that life is sustained uh, through photosynthesis. Uh, that that miracle on the plant that changes sun and water and minerals into some kind of uh, a cellulose material that all kinds of animals eat in the food chain from the microscopic up to the largest uh, is what sustains life. That's the way God planned it. And that's what that verse seems to be saying to me. Now, verse 31. And God saw all that he had made, and behold, it's very good. It's a summary statement. Every time he creates, it says it is good. But now everything is good. Now, we're not speaking of moral goodness. We are speaking of it that that which he created fulfills the purpose for which it was created. The, the organization, the backdrop for God's love affair with man is in place. Notice it says, and it was the evening and the morning, the sixth day. The evening and the morning are where the rabbis get the idea that the day begins at twilight. That's why the Jewish day still begins at twilight. The Sabbath begins at 6 p.m. Friday and runs to 6 p.m. Saturday, and they get it from Genesis 1. Now, the sixth day. The sixth day is very much like the third day. On the third day, two different things were created. On the sixth day, two different things were created. So we have basically eight acts of creation in six days. Now, chapter 2. There really should not be a chapter division here, for chapter 2, 1 through 3 should go with chapter 1. And thus the heavens and the earth were completed. Now, the word heavens here probably refers, number one, to the atmosphere above the earth, and number two, to the starry heavens beyond the atmosphere. The rabbis argued over are there three or seven heavens. When Paul was caught up in a trance to the presence of God in 2 Corinthians 12, he said he was caught up to the third heaven. Now, basically, that would be the atmosphere above the earth, the starry canopy beyond the atmosphere, and the throne of God beyond that. So here it seems to refer to the first two. Notice where it says, and all their host. Many have tried to read into this the creation of the angels, because the word host is often used for the angels. And I think that we can get that for certainly from the New Testament and several passages in Deuteronomy. It speaks of God creating the angels. Since we know that the angelic creation preceded the, the creation of matter and of man, then I think it's probably, it could be a summary statement of all of God's creative act, including the spiritual realm, the physical realm, and his unique creation, man. And by the seventh day, 
God completed his work. Now, I, I, I want to say a word about the a seven-day week. The history of this is shrouded in unrecorded prehistoric time. But every um, anthropological group that we have found have had a seven-day week. It seems to me that there is a, a truth that is behind all cultures that goes downhill from the Tower of Babel. And apparently seven days was a pattern set very early in the life of man, and I think here by God. Notice it said that, uh, which he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all the work he had done. Now the word rested here is the same root as the word Sabbath. We've got to be careful that we don't make this too anthropomorphic. Uh, this whole two chapters are very anthropomorphic. God walks and talks in the cool of the garden. God speaks and things come. Um, here we have God rested. Now, of course, you know that God does not have a physical body. Uh, he is spirit. He does not have a right hand. He does not have a throne. He does not have nostrils. He does not have eyes. And yet, the only terms we have to describe God are human terms. And so we speak about God as if he were a man, but in reality we know he isn't. That's why it's not a problem to call him a he, for we know he's not a he. Many times God's called he, many times God's called she. And so he takes the best of both and supersedes both. Now this idea of rest is very interesting. God, of course, did not need to rest. Why did he do it? Because the crown of his creation did. He made us thus. Apparently, even before the fall, man's physical body needed rest, even before sin entered the world. Now, this concept of, of rest becomes very important because God makes this a very special day. This concept of rest is picked up on in Psalms 95, 7 through 11, and is interpreted for us in the book of Hebrews, chapter 3, verse 7, through chapter 4, 11 where the word rest is interpreted in at least three or four different ways. First, the Bible speaks, not only in Genesis, but later on, of God's Sabbath rest. And the rabbis say this never ended. It says the evening and the morning were the sixth day, but it never says the morning came of the seventh day. And so the rabbis say the seventh day rest is still open, which basically is a metaphor described fellowship with God. Therefore, God's desire to be with man is always available if man will. Now, in Hebrews, this is also used for the promised land because he swore he would not let them enter his rest. Unless we see that we're changing from the seventh day of creation to the Sabbath rest, we're going to badly misinterpret that psalm, which would imply that Moses and Aaron and all the faithful Levites and everybody who came out of Egypt is eternally spiritually lost from God. I don't believe that. They just did not make the promised land, which is called the rest. The other use is heaven, or to be with God. And that's also used in Hebrews chapter 4. So there's three different uses of rest that I think build on this account. Notice it says, he sanctified it. This is the word holied. I know that's not a verb, holied, but it's a, it's a good one. Basically, the word uh, holy means to set apart for God's use. God not only knew that man needed to rest, he knew that man needed to worship. Now, in Deuteronomy, in the Ten Commandments, the Sabbath is made not only for man, but for the animals, a sociological reason. In Exodus chapter 20, it's a theological reason of man worshiping. I think both are involved. Man needs physical rest, and man needs physical, a spiritual refreshment. Both are crucial for man being all that he can be. I think it's amazing to me here when it says, and God resting from all his work which God had created and made. I think one of the most significant things about the early part of Genesis is the dignity and honor that God gives to man. I know man has blown it, uh, but you know what? Jesus really shows us the dignity and worth of man. That God could fully become a man is really amazing unless you see the dignity and worth of mankind. Now, I know there's evil and, and, and problems and self, and the fall has really messed things up. I think it marred the image. But the potential for who we were created to be, the potential for fellowship with God, the potential for leadership in God's created order, 
the potential for a meaningful, uh, ongoing fellowship and relationship. The Bible even calls friends of God, sons of God, family of God. It's amazing. And Jesus fully and completely shows us what man could have been, what man ought to be, what man will be. The shocking truth of the Bible is that man is above the angels in his relationship to God. That's why the rabbi said the angels were jealous about God giving the law to Moses and about God creating man. We will judge the angels, the Bible says. Amazing. Now they seem so spiritual, so powerful, so above us. And yet, when we are what we were meant to be, they will be a lower order. Now, this can be taken to the extremes, and some of the heretical forms of this would be Mormonism. Um, and I think they go far beyond. Uh, uh, Islam has a very physical, physical view of heaven uh, and in that, and I think that's much, much uh, beyond what the Old Testament teaches. But boy, I rejoice in the dignity of man. You know, Psalms 8 sums up so beautifully what man could have been. Psalms 8 is used again in Hebrews chapter 2. I think the best, the best commentary on the Old Testament uh, is the book of Hebrews. I want to show you a couple of books that I've used in this study that will help you very much when you do Old Testament studies. One of them is Synonyms of the Old Testament by Griddlestone. It's a word study book, and it will really help you. It's paperback. I hope you'll index it in your study Bible, um, and I think you'll really appreciate this. Another book is a Theology of the Old Testament by A.B. Davidson, published by T.N.T. Clark. This is a systematic theology of the Old Testament, and it'll link themes together. And boy, it's so helpful. Then one of my favorite systematic theology books by Burkhoff, put out by Erdman's, will link all the Bible together. It'll ask many questions. It'll show what some folks believe and give you reasons why it's, they think it's true and why it's not true. Uh, it is one of those helpful books to pull together these theological things uh, of any book I've, that I use to study. Example, the image and likeness. We can't get that exegetically. This is very helpful of how it's developed in history. I've enjoyed being with you. I hope you rejoice in who God made you to be. Male and female created he them. Have a good day.